Ron Toomer is the undisputed king of roller coaster design. A former rocket engineer, Toomer has been involved in the creation of 83 coasters. He always starts in the same unassuming way, with a simple piece of wire twisted into a few loops and turns for maximum terror. Somebody once called me a fright merchant, um, and and I don't, you know, we don't. I don't think we had to try to scare them. I just think by virtue of the product we have, it scares them already. Some people like to get beat up and bashed around, and others don't. So, so we had to sort of walk the line of having an exciting ride that's going to, you know, scare people or whatever without without damaging. Them. But how new is the ride? What's behind the Drakken Fire and all the other coasters that have ever been built? On March 31, 1959, beer company Anheuser-Busch expanded on their Tampa brewery for beer tastings and company events. Part of this expansion included the addition of a bird garden, coining the name Bush Gardens. This was not the first brewery of this type for the company, as a few had been opened in California in the past, offering tasters and visitors additional attractions. Six years later, in 1965, the Serengeti Plain exhibit opened, expanding the number and types of animals at the park. Along with this, a monorail was added to enhance guest viewing experiences of the freely roaming animals. By 1968, Busch Gardens Tampa was Florida's most popular tourist destination. A few years later, in 1971, Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom opened, giving Busch Gardens a major competitor in the state. That same year, another Busch Gardens would open in Houston. Four years after that, everything changed for the wildlife and beer parks. Busch Gardens Tampa opened its first roller coaster. In 1976, Python opened to the public, fitting with the park's African theme. The Busch Gardens in California was themed after the South Pacific, and Busch Gardens Houston was themed after Asia, but neither of these would develop into fully-fledged amusement parks. Busch Gardens Houston would close in 1973, and Busch Gardens California would close in 1979, both due to lack of attendance. But there was a fourth park. Just about everybody, at one time or another, dreams of a trip to Europe. But just how many of us can afford it? I'd like to show you what you can do on this side of the Atlantic for less than seven dollars. This is the old country now being built by Bush Gardens at Williamsburg, Virginia, near Washington, D.C. And this book will help you plan a visit this spring when the old country opens. For your free copy, write Bush Gardens, Williamsburg, Virginia, and start planning to join us in the old country on this side of the Atlantic. On May 16, 1975, Anheuser-Busch opened an amusement park outside of their Williamsburg brewery as a method to promote the Virginian town. The park opened as Busch Gardens the Old Country, accompanying Busch Gardens Tampa, then named Busch Gardens the Dark Continent. They would be renamed around the same time in the early 90s to Busch Gardens Williamsburg and Busch Gardens Tampa Bay. In 2006 to 2008, they would be renamed to Busch Gardens Europe and Busch Gardens Africa, respectively, before reverting back to their previous titles. The two parks had more continuity than just their names, though, and they would remain closely tied to one another as they developed and grew. A few years after opening, in June of 1978, Busch Gardens Williamsburg opened the Loch Ness Monster, the world's first roller coaster with interlocking loops, which mirrored the style and specs of Tampa's Python. For 1,400 years it has eluded man. Vague rumors, questionable evidence, all have led to dead ends in man's endless search for the monster until now. For as surely as you hear my voice, the Loch Ness Monster lives. Terrible in its power to drive men mad with fear. See for yourself when the Loch Ness Monster surfaces. At the old country Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. 
1996, Tampa received Montu, a record-breaking inverted coaster, followed by Williamsburg's Alpengeist in 1997, which was another inverted coaster breaking Montu's records. This practice of back and forth continues today, but if you look at the lineups of the two parks, you might notice one coaster is without a sibling. In 1993, Busch Gardens Tampa Bay opened Kumba, an inverting wild and thrilling coaster that implemented many unique and new elements. Don't miss the daily afternoon race between the Heron and the monorail. Someone obviously enjoys it. Then there's the main attraction. Kumba! The word Kumba means roar in the African Congo language. And this coaster really roars. Designed by Bolliger and Maviard of Switzerland and opened in 1993, Kumba introduced three first-of-a-kind elements. The camelback, a maneuver which creates three seconds of weightlessness while spiraling 360 degrees. A diving loop, which plunges you into a loop from a height of 100 feet. And a 108-foot vertical loop, the world's largest. During the 2 minute 54 second ride, you'll also be taken through a cobra roll, an oblique loop, vertical spiral, and a double corkscrew at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour and pulling 3 and 3 quarter Gs. Do you want to get off now or, uh, uh oh, too late now. Kumba is still operating today, and there's not a similar coaster in Williamsburg. So was Kumba destined to be an only child? Not at all. In fact, it was actually the second born. In the small town of Monty, Switzerland in 1987, the roller coaster manufacturer Giovanola underwent a change in management. Two of their employees, Walter Bolliger and Claude Mabillard, decided to leave the company and form their own, hiring two other employees during their startup. After leaving Giovanola, Bolliger and Mabillard decided that they would not design any more amusement park rides. That was until Six Flags contacted them, persuading them to build their first coaster. After hiring more employees and finding contractors, B&M constructed Iron Wolf at Six Flags Great America. Two years later, B&M would design Batman the Ride, also for Six Flags Great America, creating the world's first inverted coaster. This began their long and prosperous career manufacturing thrill rides, and over time, they developed a unique style recognizable to park goers. While at Giovanola, Bulger and Mabillard would work with another Switzerland-based roller coaster design company, Intamin. Intamin has manufactured and or designed past defunct line editions, Back to the Future the Ride, Jaws the Ride, and Disaster Transport. Intamin and BMM's work are often compared, as the company's products appear incredibly similar. The style of the track and supports, for example, are nearly identical, as Bulger and Mabillard helped develop this while at Giovanola. However, there is one main difference between the two companies, their willingness to take risks. Intamin is not afraid to push the limits on their designs. For instance, Intamin built the tallest roller coaster in the world, King Dakka, at Six Flags Great Adventure. Most of the time, the results of their risks are worth it, and result in incredible and new attractions. Sometimes, though, the products are less than reliable, such as Knott's Berry Farms Accelerator, which Intamin manufactured. Accelerator is a launch coaster that reaches over 80 miles an hour in 2.3 seconds, and the cable responsible for the launch has snapped on two occasions, one time injuring a rider. B&M is the antithesis to this. They are often criticized for playing it safe, and not innovating outside of different car and restraint styles. The upside of this is obvious, as B&M's coasters are notoriously safe and efficient, and they have incredibly high uptimes, especially when compared to Intamin, whose coasters are sometimes infamous for their downtimes. B&M's mindset of careful and thoughtful production resulted in them declining Busch Gardens' request for two coasters, one at each of their parks. At this point, B&M had only created a few coasters, and the overwhelming success of Batman the Ride brought a flood of requests for copies and new inverted coasters from the company. Busch Gardens had requested the coasters for a 1993 release, which would have been difficult for B&M, as they were already working on a Batman clone for Six Flags Great Adventure and another inverted coaster for California's Great Adventure. Busch Gardens did not take no for an answer, and B&M once again gave in to the pressure, agreeing to build just one of the two requested coasters. It was settled that the company would build Kumba for Busch Gardens Tampa, but Busch Gardens did not wish to leave Williamsburg without a new coaster, so they went searching for another company. The problem with this is that the concept and design for Kumba had been settled, so the second company company would have to match B&M's coaster, a ride that hadn't been built yet. So what poor company did Busch Gardens hire to match the strength, power, and reliability of B&M's coaster?
In 1942, a machine shop near Mountain View, California was opened under the name Aero Development, founded by Andy Anderson, Carl Bacon, William Hardiman, and Edgar Morgan. Originally operating as a simple parts manufacturer, Aero took notice of the boom of the amusement park industry following World War II. They began to dabble in ride manufacturing, and in 1948, they built their first ride, a merry-go-round for the city of San Jose. They expanded their production of amusement park rides, even reaching out to Walt Disney after hearing the news of Disneyland's construction in 1952. Arrow hoped that Disney would be interested in their new paddle boat design. However, Disney was more interested in the other attractions the company was producing. He contracted the company hoping they could innovate new types of ride for Disneyland. Arrow got to work, creating ride after ride for the new park. Their contributions led to the creation of opening day attractions King Arthur's Carousel, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, Mad Tea Party, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, the Casey Jr. Circus Train, and Snow White's Scary Adventures. They would later help create Alice in Wonderland, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, and past defunct land edition, Submarine Voyage. Perhaps Arrow's biggest contribution to Disney parks was the Matterhorn bobsleds in 1959, with which they ultimately invented the steel coaster. While they were Disney's go-to manufacturer and designer, Arrow ventured into plenty of other parks, becoming a staple of the amusement park industry. When you think of a looping roller coaster, you're probably thinking of an Arrow corkscrew. When you think of log flumes, splash boats, mine trains, suspended coasters, all Arrow. They were the king of the industry. But industries change, new companies enter, and existing ones progress. In 1971, Disney opened their own in-house manufacturer, Central Shops. Executive Vice President Dick Nunes broke the news to Arrow that their help was no longer needed, saying, quote, I have to admit that we could not have done this without you, but it's over now. We built this big facility and we're going to do everything ourselves. The next year, Arrow development was sold off, and it would be passed along, being bought by company after company, eventually becoming Aerodynamics by the late 80s. Dizzy from the absorptions and dissolvements, and still trying to find their footing in an ever-changing industry, Arrow was still able to hold on to some incredibly talented designers, such as the legendary Ron Toomer. Arrow also had an advantage in that it had a long record with most of the major amusement parks. They had produced some of the original monorails, the Python and Loch Ness Monster coasters, and the Big Bad Wolf suspended coaster all for Busch Gardens. So when the company approached them about building a new coaster for their Williamsburg Park, they accepted. There were just a few conditions. Dynamics. And while other manufacturers are content to coast along, Arrow continues to speed down the fast track that's advanced our coaster technology light years beyond anyone else. In fact, we've helped America's most exciting parks have record-breaking attendance for the past 20 years. Busch Gardens Williamsburg cranked up the heat to a scorching new level when they unleashed Arrow's Drakenfire. A mile-long ride on the back of this tubular steel dragon will fire up even the coolest coaster fan. Drakenfire from Arrow Dynamics. The monster has left its lair and is now the hottest ticket in town at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. In 1991, the general manager of Busch Gardens, Keith Kaysen, announced Williamsburg's newest attraction, a steel coaster named Drock and Fire. The coaster would be placed in Williamsburg's Oktoberfest area, near Arrow's Big Bad Wolf. Construction began in 1991, and was completed in early 1992. The coaster was set to open on April 4th, with a special appearance by comedian and self-proclaimed roller coaster enthusiast Dana Carvey. However, the ride experienced issues on its opening day, which Carvey compensated for through means of an impromptu stand-up routine. But its technical difficulties would not be a major problem for the ride during its lifespan. In fact, guests had more reason to be afraid when Dragon Fire was operating correctly. Hang on, because the ride's just begun. For within earshot of your fading screams is Drakenfire, Busch Gardens' newest and most spine-tingling coaster experience yet. A dizzying 15 stories tall at its highest point, Drakenfire is one of the largest steel coasters in North America. Busch Gardens wanted Drakenfire to be one of a kind with first-time elements, a new car design, and a more freestanding, non-traditional support system for the tracks. All in all, a moving monument to the physics of fun. And fun and thrills are what Drakenfire is all about. Anticipation builds as riders make the quick 15-story ascent to Drakenfire's highest point. 
As the cars begin their first plunge, they are inverted briefly before careening 120 feet to the ground at over 60 miles per hour. After this disorienting first drop, riders are turned upside down five more times, hurtling along 3,550 feet of electric blue track through a series of inverted elements, including three corkscrews and three new elements never tried before on any other roller coaster. Daring riders will first encounter the famed camelback hump, which produces a few seconds of near weightlessness. Next in the series of unique elements is the fiery bat wing, which rolls passengers upside down twice in a boomerang type of effect. With hardly enough time to catch their breath, passengers will then whip through a corkscrew where they will encounter the cutback element, which rotates cars upside down inside a loop and then whips through yet another corkscrew, leading to the grand finale, a fast 360-degree spiral before returning to the station. Drakenfire reached a height of 150 feet tall, with a ride time of just under two minutes. Drakenfire is one of the most unique and baffling coasters ever created, obviously built by a company out of their element. Drakenfire's similarities with Kumba and other B&M coasters are obvious yet mind-numbing. Arrow's desperate attempts to match the look and feel of a B&M coaster is what would eventually lead to Drakenfire's failure. For instance, Arrow coasters have a very distinct support structure, a cluttered cross-beaming mountain of metal. B&Ms, on the other hand, implement simple and elegant tubes for their supports. Instead of using their own method to build Drakenfire, Arrow attempted to recreate B&M style. This is the first Arrow coaster to have this type of support, and the company's lack of experience with such structures not only led to a coaster that was awkward to the eye, but also had an imperfect amateur feel. After seeing the designs of Kumba, Arrow wanted to have a similar loop over Drakenfire's lift hill, but supposedly they couldn't figure out how to with the track's layout. They opted for an inversion during the first drop instead. This awkward corkscrew is jarring, as guests come out of it fast, eventually reaching 60 miles per hour. Arrow went as far as to use a similar computer system to B&M's, which they had never used in the past and would never use again. The new elements and unique design were fascinating, and for some, worth the ride. For the general public, however, Drakenfire was simply too rough. With the first few weeks of operation, riders were already choosing not to ride the coaster for this reason. Busch Gardens attempted to remedy this around 1994 by eliminating one of the six inversions, the diving corkscrew element, replacing it with a straight piece of track. The head-rattling nature of the ride was still so intense that Busch Gardens warned riders to remove their earrings so they would not lose them. Still, it was Williamsburg's newest coaster, and they weren't afraid to shove it in front of a camera for press releases and publicity. Although it's nestled in the rolling hills of Southern Virginia, a visit to Busch Gardens Williamsburg is like taking a mini tour through Europe. It's a very large theme park, and uh, this thing looks more like a field map to the uh, Normandy invasion than a uh, map to a theme park, so I can't really figure out exactly where I'm going or what I'm doing, but there's a lot of great things to see here, apparently. It's the fastest roller coaster here, upside down five times. Sayonara! Fortunately, my vertebrae snap like a twig, or I'd get up. But uh, the doctor should be here shortly, and then we'll continue on with our adventure. In 1997, however, the rambunctious dragon, the B&M wannabe, would be put in its place. In 1997, B&M opened their first addition to Williamsburg's lineup, the aforementioned Alpengeist, the tallest and fastest inverted coaster in the world. It was an instant hit, not only drawing audiences away from Drakenfire, but also exemplifying its inadequacies. By 1998, the small section where Drakenfire was located was looking less like an attraction and more like a ghost town. In the middle of the 1998 season, Drakenfire was closed. Busch Garden spokesperson Cindy Sarko said, There has been a steady erosion of ridership combined with the high operating expenses of the ride. It helps officials make the decision to shut it down. She would add that Busch Gardens might attempt to modify the ride, giving fans hope that it would open once again. However, this became more and more unlikely as time passed. In 1999, Drakenfire was listed for sale. While there were several potential buyers, no agreements were made, and Drakenfire sat still in Oktoberfest, waiting for its eventual demise. However, hope was reignited during the 2001 Passholders Preview Day, three years after the ride closed. 
Several guests reported seeing the ride running, with Busch Gardens seemingly testing the ride for a reopening, but this wasn't the case. The next year, in February 2002, Drakenfire was dismantled and recycled for scrap. At this point, Arrow couldn't care less, as the company had moved on to other, more disastrous projects that would eventually lead to their bankruptcy and demise. B&M, on the other hand, is still creating high-quality coasters all over the world. Drakenfire's remaining queue and maintenance structures are now used for the park's Halloween events, and the former land occupied by the ride is now used for concerts at the park. In 2016, Busch Gardens apparently began selling Drakenfire t-shirts again, trying to capitalize on those nostalgic for the ride. Drakenfire was a monster, a wild, untamed, rough monster that was trying to be something that it wasn't. The attraction was only open for five years. It is impressive that it is so widely regarded as a disaster despite the fact that there were no major accidents or incidents with the ride. It might be because it was destructive to everything evenly, so it is hard to pick out one single case. The riders, designers, and managers alike all felt the damage of Drakenfire's flame, and none of them could handle the heat.